o Yeah, I think Anil Kumar Ji, we can start, please. Uh, very good evening to all of you. I welcome our distinguished alumnus and resource person, Dr. Manu K. Vora Ji, He's Chairman and President of Business Excellence Incorporation USA. And I also welcome Dr. Gidhari Lal Ji Garg and other dignitaries from AICT, uh, Dr. Sri Shakti Tiwari Ji, Secretary Alma Ward, you are also welcome. I also welcome the other executives from industries, faculty members, and students from AICT associated colleges, affiliated colleges, my colleagues from this institute, media people, and my own students from IIDBHU. Everybody is being welcomed this evening to the second session of Soft Skill Program. The second session we are going to have on effective decision making. The Soft Skill Program in total has six sessions. The first session was on uh, uh, effective leadership skill program is being organized by the training placement cell of IIT BHU Varanasi in association with All India Council for Technical Education, New Delhi, and also in association with uh, Indo Alma Word. When I am coining this word AICT or All India Council for Technical Education, let me be very specific. It is Atal Academy, which is specifically associated with this program. I'm indeed very happy to share that this program is being witnessed by uh, on online platform by our 8,000 plus registered students and other thousands of our students on YouTube, lakhs of students from 9,000 plus colleges across our, uh, this country. Uh, I'm also happy to share that a good number of industry executives, they are also attending this program. Now, coming to the subject of today's discussion, effective decision making is a very, very important topic. Many of us just go for an option. Why option? Just an action. Without and that too, we claim that yes, we have taken the decision. Fact is that for having a decision taken, we must have good number of alternatives uh, listed out. And out of these alternatives, we have to choose one. When we go and we choose the uh, alternative, and not only we should look into its strength, but we should look into the other aspects, its weaknesses, and so on and so forth. And even after we have done it, to make it effective, we should not miss out the objective, the reason for which we are taking the decision. We should have focus on the goal, the objective itself. In case we are doing it, then only we are doing effective decision making. I'm going to invite Dr. Manu K. Vora to share his experiences uh, with us related to effective decision making. Before that, let me introduce Dr. Manu K. Vora. Dr. Manu Vora Ji, he's Chairman and President of Business Excellence Incorporated. It's a global quality management consulting firm based in Chicago, USA. He has over 47 years of leadership ex experience and has, he has guided Fortune 500 companies with Baldrige Performance Excellence Assessment for over 29 years. As an adjunct professor, he has taught operations management courses at business schools globally. He has contributed at over 680 educational institutes worldwide. He is a sought-after speaker on business excellence and quality management topics with over 1,220 presentations globally in 36 countries across five continents. He has published over 75 scholarly articles in addition to 50 blog posts on quality management. In 2013, he gave two TEDx talks, TEDx IIT BHU Varanasi and TEDx IIT Chicago, since 2013, he has delivered soft skills and quality management topics using technology to over 680 colleges and universities globally, benefiting over 1 million students, faculties, professionals. In 2016, he delivered a GAN course on project management on organization, uh, organizational excellence. This was a program approved by MHRD, Government of India, at with this very place itself. In 2016, 
He was appointed a Fulbright Specialist by the U.S. Department of State, and he completed his first Fulbright Specialist project again at this place in March 2018. Dr. Vora, he uh, holds B.Tech honors degree from this place itself in chemical engineering, which he earned in 1968. M.S. he uh, he got in 1970. P.H.D. he got in 1975. Both of these two degrees he earned in chemical engineering from Illinois Institute of Technology, Chicago. He also holds MBA degree, which he earned in 1985 in marketing management from Keller Graduate School of Management. As the founder, director, and president of Blind Foundation for India, he and his team has raised over $5.5 million to help over 2 million visually impaired adults and children in India. He received an RI of the Year Award 2018 in philanthropy from Times Now and ICIC Bank in Mumbai, India. Dr. Vora, besides getting this kind of accolade, has received 60 awards and honors for his outstanding professional services. He received 40 awards and honors for his lifelong community service, including U.S. President's Volunteer Service Award in March 2020. Was in education, UK. In 1968, he received J.N. Tata scholarship to, in India to pursue his graduate work to, in the U.S. With this brief introduction, now I invite Dr. Manu K. Vora to share his thoughts and experiences on effective decision making. Dr. Manu Vora Ji, please. Thank you, Anil Kumar Ji, for a very kind introduction. Good evening to all these all attend these distinguished faculty special thanks to dr gedal lal garg dr mamta agarwal ji and shakti tiwari for joining with us and uh, uh, let's begin this session on effective decision making so the idea is we make decisions throughout our life so if you look at the child when the child is growing up right from the beginning a uh, child has a special language to communicate and make a decision. And only time the child will cry is when the child is hungry or wet. So mother will know exactly what to do, uh, feed the baby or clean the baby and uh, put the new diaper on. So the decision making comes right at the beginning of the life we all live and throughout the life we make lots of decisions. And the key is, are we learning from the decisions we have made and are we getting better with decision making? So with that brief introduction, let me share the presentation with all of you. And uh, <clears throat> with the feedback from the last session, we are going to have just one second. I need to click the item here so that we get the sound. Bear with me for a second. I'm going to reshare with the gear. Include the system audio so we are all good. And here is the roadmap uh, for uh, this evening. We'll quickly review what happened at session one, a uh, brief uh, feedback summary, and recap the session. Uh, then what I thought was I will share with you my life's journey in terms of decision making and what impact it has made for me both professionally and personally. Then we'll work through some quotes on decision making at a high level. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities where we make decisions in professional setting as well. And uh, there will be three to four times interactions times. So I'll stop to students and followed by any questions coming in from the YouTube live from AICT. Uh, and that will be helped by Dr. Gedal uh, Gargi. Then we will look at uh, what decision making we had to do during the COVID-19 pandemic. Then several excellent decision making models will be shared. And we'll look at some of the best practices of decision making in action. And there is 
opponent about ethical decision making, which is so critical to be successful and sustainable throughout our life. A uh, lot of talked about at the first session. The purpose of these sessions is to deliver the knowledge, and your role as a listener is to pick at least two key takeaways from the session, which you will try to implement once you are back in the institute, either as a student or a faculty or a professional working in the industry. So very quickly, review of the feedback. We had a four simple questions on the questionnaire and the overall session we received 100% satisfied and very satisfied. Second one was learn new concepts and ideas from the session. Uh, so 98.7% said satisfied and very satisfied and able to apply new concepts, ideas in the study and the work. 92% felt that they will be able to use the concepts they have learned in the leadership excellence first session for their study and work. So thank you very much for providing the good feedback so we can keep improving our sessions. Here were the five key takeaways from the session, balance of IQ, EQ, and SQ, intelligent quotient, emotional quotient, and social quotient. Leader versus the boss, that uh, contrast. Leaders share credit, leadership models, and take the blame and distribute the success. This is truly the level five leadership, Jim Collins, Highwood Business Review article. Now, uh, very quickly, social media views, as mentioned, as of about half an hour ago, eight o'clock uh, India time uh, today, over 17,000 views at the AICT uh, YouTube streaming, sharing, uh, live viewing with about 800 students, and then YouTube views and Facebook views shown here. So some total over 18,000 views so far in one week. And we are very appreciative that people are looking at this information and the request is take something out of the session and put it in action. That will be the best satisfaction. And uh, shown the recording of the first session from AICT site here. So if we take a quick look at what transpired in the first session, it's summed up here in this slide. So leadership is all about influencing, igniting, and inspiring ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Second one, leaders define purpose. They create vision, identify key strategies, allocate right resources, and achieve results through people. So this second aspect ties in the effective decision making. So for leaders to do those things, they need to have very sharp decision making skills and they continue to own up the, those skills throughout their tenure. And leadership is all about walking the talk, put it in practice. Don't keep talking big things, but if you don't deliver, people will figure it out. So that's the essence of the first session. And as I mentioned, these are all integrated sessions, one session feeding into the other, ultimately leading to understanding how to do effective project management and then how to apply that to serve the community and solve the society's problems. So with that, I'm going to start sharing my life's journey and decision making. And there are a lot of inflection points. So very first one happened when I was six years old, when I lost both my parents. And uh, immediately I began to focus on education. That was the way out of difficult times in the early childhood. Then uh, in 1959, I was around 14 years old. I lost the eyesight due to freak firecracker accidents and 30 years later we started the blind foundation for india ngo it was a great decision to join the temple of learning banaras hindu university in order to enter for my undergrad education 
In 68, joined IIT Chicago for graduate and postgraduate work. After finishing my PhD, joined Institute of Gas Technology for Energy Applied Research. Then in 82, joined AT&T Bell Labs, and that was the beginning of understanding the importance of quality in all domains. 87, joined American Society for Quality, worldwide organization, presence in about 150 countries, and at that time, there they had over 100,000 members and had a tremendous networking through ASQ. 1989, 30 years after I became blind as a child, we started the Blind Foundation for India NGO to continue free Chakshudan project. We are in the 33rd years now, 33 years. Then in 93, joined IIT Stewart School of Business as adjunct faculty in operations management area. And that was beginning of my academics after about 18 years of industry experience to bring experience at the academic level. 2000, I left AT&T and joined and started my own company, Business Excellence Inc. That was beginning of the entrepreneurship and then started teaching and training executives in India to achieve the academic excellence and professional excellence. 2013 gave to TEDx talk on the gift of giving. 2013 started soft skill program in India. That's a free Gyandan project. We are in the ninth year. And 2016 received the Fulbright specialist appointment from US Department of State and uh, very honored to be associated with the ICTE since 2020 for NEP 2020 implementation. So I think all of us can reflect back on whatever station in life we are at. There are decisions which gets made and that can help you or doesn't help you effectively based on how you make the decisions and what value add those decisions bring to your life. So let's take a look at quick few decisions on few quotes on decision making. The first one is from a person named Lee Ayakoka. He was the president and CEO of Ford Motor Company. He had just retired. Then a Chrysler Corporation was in trouble. So they, he said, I'll only expect you to come out of the difficult situation. So he says, if I had to sum up in a word, what makes a good manager, I would say decisiveness. We can have all the data and numbers, but in the end, you have to set a timetable and act. So when you do that, you are a good decision maker, good manager, good leader. Second one from Jim Collins. Uh, we saw his work in the first module on uh, leadership excellence. He says, greatness is not a function of circumstance. Greatness, it turns out, largely matter of conscious choice and discipline. That is making effective decisions when they need to be made. And Peter Drucker, the father of management, talks about most discussion of decision making assume that only senior executives make decisions or that only senior executives decisions matter this is a dangerous mistake. The idea is people working in any organization, everybody's decision making helps to serve the customer well. So it's not just the top level executives, but everyone through the entire chain, their decision making will have an impact to serve the customers and take the organization to new height. Uh, we are going to look at uh, several opportunities where decisions are made in the professional setting. So first one is when you are hiring a person. So either you are a student going for internship, you go through the interviews, many people apply for a single job, who gets picked, that requires decision making. And a lot of time it's done through several interviews for the job and offer is made onboarding. Once you join the organization, there needs to be orientation. 
and that needs to be done quickly so that you get to understand the vision, mission, and values of the organization. What is the, who are the key customers? What are the key products and services? Initial training, ongoing training. So when I joined Bell Labs in 1983, uh, they had a structured six months training for new person joining. And uh, that training gave me foundation in telecommunication, switching uh, transmission and access areas, which I was not very familiar at all because I was a chemical engineer to start. And then there is a structured ongoing specific training depending on each and every person's skill set to do skilling, reskilling, and upskilling. Initial assignment, ongoing assignment, first six months, the assignment is tailored to make the new person a success. And the supervisor will provide necessary support and then further assignments as you progress at the organization. Performance feedback. So if you are a person who have 10 people reporting to you, uh, you need to be working with one-on-one -on, -one on each of those 10 people who reports to you and focus on their areas of strengths. And that requires good decisions on both sides, on the employee side as well as the employer side, and give them necessary developmental feedback so they continue to improve the performance to help the organization. Coaching. Now, this is the coaching in a sense the supervisor or a manager finds out what are the strengths of a person and figure figures out the assignments in a strengths. And we are going to expand on the theory of strength work from the Gallup organization in the teamwork module. Mentoring, extremely critical. When you join an organization, your progress in the organization depends on finding good mentors and they are the one who will look after your interests. They will groom you. And I was very delighted that I had a mentor I mentioned in the first session, <coughs> director, Mr. John Dallator. He was my mentor as long as he was at this campus here in Naperville, Illinois. Professional growth. We all need to grow professionally. Once we join an organization, the motto should be lifelong learning. So either getting a degree or getting a terminal degree is not the end of uh, learning. That is just the beginning. We should all become lifelong learners and continue to grow professionally. And the way to look at it is if we don't grow professionally, we are not able to add value to the organization. At the same time, we are not valuable to ourselves either. Promotions. So when there is a promotion coming up, one position, three people are in consideration. So who to promote and who not to promote is a requires a good decision making on the part of leadership team. Termination, when people do not work out for whatever reason, the leaders have to use decision making through HR function to give the notice for termination so they can go and find a better place elsewhere. Capital projects, when four to five different capital projects are coming up, request for funding. The, each of these projects are scrutinized by the leadership team and they do cost benefit analysis and fund only one or two because the resources are scarce. And the projects with the biggest bank for the buck, they will be the one and decision making the role of the top leaders to do the strategic planning as we discussed in the first session. And that requires gathering all the information about customers, employees, processes, competition, regulation, environment, uh, and uh, any technological changes, etc. With a lot of information at hand, leaders get together, spend a good amount of time to craft out the strategic plan for the organization. And they need to continue to update it when 
situation change. Team formation. So when difficult issue arises, either for customer operations or people or finance, leaders will decide to form a team and they will pick a right team leader based on experience and expertise. The team leader in turn will recruit necessary team members, small in number, and try to bring variety of skill set to solve the problem for which team was chartered. Managing suppliers, another big decision point. You have number of suppliers for various things. You need to have essentially a big spreadsheet and now with the computer, we can have tremendous amount of information on each supplier put together on a single database and single sheet and then compare and contrast who are the best in terms of pricing, in terms of their ability to be flexible, their reputation, their delivery and past historical experience. Time management, how do we spend time at work between nine to five? That is a tremendous implication on what you can accomplish. Are you wasting time on trivial things or are you focused on working on important things? That's your decision. How to manage the change that is figuring out improvement areas. And lastly, I'm sure those who have done the internship and those who have worked for somebody, the bosses always have a to-do list for you. Now you have to keep track of it. If you don't work on any of those items, you may not be there for a longer time. So keep your management and your leaders in the loop on what you are working on and prioritize that work. So here are the various opportunities where we make decisions in a professional setting. So on the flip side, on the personal level, we also make a lot of decisions. So schooling, where why the students who came to IIT BHU, why did you choose the school, the university here? Once you get settled, what about your spouse's education? Once you have a family, where will you send your children for education, K through 12, undergrad, grad, postgrad, etc.? A lot of decisions needed. The jobs you pick up after graduation, and what about your spouse when you are you're married? financial, where, when, and how will you invest? And keep in mind that once you start working, you should put aside certain amount of money to take care of your retirement, more like rainy season fund. Shopping, where will you go to get durable and non-durable goods? Again, the decision making comes in play. Housing, beginning you will rent, later on when you are well to do, you can have your own apartment or even your own bungalow. Automobile, simple transportation vehicle to more comfortable car as you progress in life. All the appliances you want to buy, clothing for yourself, for family, where you go to place of worship, sports either you play or watch. Vacations, very important. When I was at at and Bell Labs, our leaders emphasized that every vacation for sure, whatever number of weeks you are accumulating for that year and take vacation away from the work, recharge your battery, come back and add more value, develop some hobbies that requires decision making personal improvement. We all need to figure out what we want to improve at the individual level. And that is a decision again, books to read, to continue to replenish our knowledge. As I mentioned, lifelong learning is the key. Again, managing our time outside work. How do you manage that time to achieve simple things you have set the goals for? And of course, once you get married, uh, just watch out, your spouse will give you to-do list. They call it honey to-do list. So keep track of that. If you don't do most of the things and uh, ignore that, you may not get the lunch or a dinner that day. 
So lots of decision making uh, we saw, and I'll take one slide and then we'll stop and have some interactions on what we learned from it, any questions, comments, et cetera. So I'm sure we all come out from the COVID-19 pandemic finally, but during those difficult time, we had to do quick thinking and the government came out with the guidelines on decision making. So there were hygiene, uh, special hygiene tips, uh, hand washing with soap and water, minimum 20 seconds at a time, social distancing, six feet distance, wearing face, face mask when you are out. And I use also gloves when I go out, so I'm not touching unnecessarily and bringing the virus back home. Uh, develop healthy habits, eat healthy food, boost your immunity, exercise regularly, and make behavioral changes, no or minimum social gatherings, look after children and elderly and share in the house chores. And as a chemical engineer, I remember one simple operation, uh, washing. So after dinner is over, my job is to complete all the dishes and put it in the dishwasher. Adjust to modern technological and workplace changes that is more virtual meetings and collaborations and distance learning. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing and let's have questions, comments from the campus first and then through Vizal Lal Garbji from AICT YouTube Live. So Anil Kumarji, any questions, comments, kindly uh, get the questions, please. Sir, how are so, uh, yes, maybe there are people who have uh, wanted to know from you what critical factors affect the outcome of a decision, outcome of a decision. They are focusing on the decision side. Uh, yeah. What factor, yes, maybe the return that you get out of a decision, what factors will basically govern? Yeah. So, first of all, when uh, there is a situation at hand, you have to decide and take action. If you don't decide and if you are just let it go, then your outcome is guaranteed. It will not be 100% optimal. So very first thing to do is when you are at a crossroad and you have to make a decision, make a decision based on the information available to you at hand. And also I'm going to share with you a few guidelines, some models different types of decision making in terms of ethical, economical, uh, political, etc. So using the information at hand to make the best possible decision quickly. And once you make that decision, learn from the outcome of it, whether it meant it uh, essentially met your expectation or it fell short. If it met your expectation, that means you made a good decision. If it did not meet 100% of your expectation, you have to learn why the gap came. And next time when you are in a situation similar to it, make a better decision. So that will be my brief answer to that. Next question, please. Uh, do you see any advantage when you involve the people who are going to get affected in, by the kind of decision you make? Yes, definitely. Stakeholders should be consulted when decisions you make as a leader is going to impact them. You definitely want to get their input and collectively decide what's the best outcome, best decision you have to make. So if you remember, I shared uh, at the last session, the Google, their decision making practice is very unique in which where a critical issue needs to be decided upon. There is a brainstorming between the supervisor, leader, and the members of the team. And uh, collectively, they discuss, brainstorm, and come up with a best possible course of action who are going to be impacted by your decision. There are a few more questions, but uh, in case you have time, then, then we can go through all the questions. Otherwise, you just take one question, which is very interesting. Yeah. Yes. Navigate risk and uncertainty while taking a decision. Definitely. So you outcome based on where you will have the better success. 
not taking any decisions and just let it go, will it hurt you? Or you take a decision with a calculated risk and try to manage that risk. And uh, this specific question will help us understand the importance of risk in managing a project. So while you are on a project right from the beginning, you need to identify in a team setting what are the challenges and the risk which can derail your project right from the beginning until the end. Then you prioritize them high, medium, low. And for those who come out high, then you need to manage them so that they do not come in the way of progress for your project. So with that, I think we'll keep those questions for the later part of the presentation. And uh, let's get uh, Dr. Gidhar Lal Garg to see if he has one or two quick questions. Gidhar Lal Ji. Sir, somebody, well, someone is asking when we want to take the decision, which is not suitable for our attitude, but system needs that decision, then how to make them? Yeah. So in that situation, my suggestion will be consult your immediate supervisor and a manager. Because if you are not very comfortable making that decision and system requires to make that decision, keep your management in the loop, get their guidance. And once they say, yes, it's OK to go ahead, now you have kept them informed and consequences will be known to them rather than they get it as a surprise. So one thing we all need to learn, management, they do not appreciate any surprises. They want to have everything in the open. So whatever you are doing, try to keep your immediate supervisor, manager in the loop that this is a critical thing you are working on and that will have some impact. And here are the choices and I'm taking this choice are you in agreement? Do you have any further suggestion to make a better decision? Uh, one more question, Gizariji, if you have any. Yes, yes, sir. One more question. What decision Indian engineers should take to serve India for our nation or to leave India and work for other countries? <laughs> yeah. So I would put it this way. It's an individual choice, but uh, India has a lot of opportunities for growth. So I would say start with thinking about staying in India, make the contribution for the education which was paid for by the government of India. And I'll put it in a context for me personally in a second. So first choice should be serve India as long as you have the right opportunity to utilize your talents. And there are ample opportunities there with your network, with the availability of jobs there should be a good match. And then you grow in those positions. 1968, when I graduated, connections with the industry. So finding a job would have been extremely hard with the degree from the prestigious institute. So I decided to come to US for further studies. And generally, in those times, people used to stay back because opportunities were still not available in India to utilize the talent and the experiences of the expert people. So I've stayed back, but even staying back, you can do something back for the home country. And uh, I personally feel that all the alumni who have been benefited by the tremendous amount of help from the government of India in terms of education. We should all try to give back to motherland because we have gotten so much from the country. It's our time to give back to rebuild the nation. Uh, so with that, I think I would like to move on with the permission from both of you. So let's continue and hold more questions ready. So when time comes, we'll have further interaction. One more question. One Please. more question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Avishek Dixit asked me asking what factors are important for decision making. Actually, PPT was not clear that moment. Yeah, so can we hold that question? Because there are several models I'm be sharing very shortly. Uh, the what we discussed so far is just uh, material is coming in the models part, which we will catch up very shortly. So 
please hold the thought on that. Sir, can, can I take one more question, sir? Uh, sure. Sometimes we get decision but not justify properly. Uh, is it harmful? Then how to face that this situation? Yeah. Yeah, so I think again this one we will find a proper answer once I share the models for decision making. It covers all these aspects, last two questions which you brought up, uh, Gidhar Lal Gargi. So I will move on and keep the effort going here and we need to remain on track in terms of timing as well. So thank you for the interactions and the questions and we'll continue to do more and we have time. So here, yeah, uh, and kindly everybody remain on a mute while to make a lot of decisions. And when you have a complex decision to make, you put all your information on a single diagram called tree diagram. This comes from Japan, part of the quality management toolkit. And uh, here, the decision one is you want to go on vacation. Now, for the last two years, there is a lot of demand for people to travel because we are all held up inside. So you want to go on vacation, that's the highest level decision. It will open up options at decision level two, go to Europe, visit family, or go camping in state. And for each of the decision level two, there are more options at decision level three ultimately linking to the outcomes. So if you take any of the path from decision one, you want to go to Europe and you want to visit Germany, that will give you the specific outcome, have a great time revisiting sites we have already seen. So as you see in a single piece of paper, by putting all the information together, you are able to make a decision with the assurance that you have some idea of, of what the outcome will be. Now, uh, this tree diagram looks like a organization chart put on a sideways. It's a simple but very effective tool, so keep that in your toolkit. Undergrad degree, most of that in engineering, but within engineering, you have so many branches. Here at the campus at IIT BHU, there are 17 different branches they can get the degree in. I chose chemical engineering, but I had petroleum engineering as my minor in the final year. You can choose to go into the business discipline. Again, variety of options, finance, accounting, marketing, strategy, etc. Uh, you can go in the law, specialize in various disciplines, real estate, patent law, etc. You can join medicine, again, more options, more decisions to be made, uh, internal medicine, pediatrics, surgery, etc. Or if your inclination and your interests are in fine arts, liberal arts, life sciences, or pharmaceutics, you pick up that branch. And my sincere request is, that in general in India scene, a lot of time parents make a decision which branch you will enter as a student. My request to parents is please hold off, allow the child, man or a woman, to make their own decision to select their branch based on their area of interest. And I can tell you why I chose chemical engineering, because I was good with chemistry and mathematics combination of the two allow me to excel in chemical engineering. And we had a wonderful faculty uh, starting with Dr. Gopal Tripathi then. He was the department head. He had uh, essentially started the department after returning from USA at BHU that time, which is now IIT BHU. So allow the person to use the interest to select the branch, you will be more successful. And second comment I want to make, that if you are an engineer, having one degree is not enough. You can take some elective courses in business side of the house, which is the business managing the work of the engineers. And vice versa, if you are in the business side, pick up the technology as elective courses so that you are more proficient 
and I was very lucky that after my PhD in chemical engineering, I went for MBA with marketing management that has helped me both professionally and personally. So ultimately, the outcome is whatever decisions you have made to select a branch should lead to meaningful work. So some of you will join the corporate, which is a routine uh, track, but some who are very brave will choose to become the educators like Professor Anil Kumarji and others. Uh, some will join the government, NGO or R&D labs. And I tell you the real essence is think about becoming an entrepreneur. So we had Dr. Mohammed Yunus here in 2015. He had come here to my campus at IIT Chicago and we had a chance to escort him to go to Chicago Public Radio for his interview. During the interview, he made a profound statement that our education system is lopsided. We are creating job seekers rather than job creators. In other words, the education system should focus on preparing more entrepreneurs who will work on a unique idea concepts for which customer is willing to pay and they will employ many more people rather than you keep begging for a job. So think of it this way. If you become entrepreneurs, you are going to employ many more of your other people, including your friends from the campus. So keep that in mind. So that's all about decision making. And now I'm going to share a very short YouTube on group decision making to understand the dynamics of making a decision in the group setting. Let's look at an example of group decision making and how using decision skills can help. This is Mike, Chris, Matt, and Arlo. They like hanging out together because they're pretty good friends. This Friday night, they're going out to eat before they go to a friend's party. Where do you want to go, says Mike. I don't care, says Chris. Me neither, says Matt. It's good, though. Sounds like it should be pretty easy, right? But here's the thing. Mike, Chris, Matt, and Arlo all have different ideas about how this is going to work out. And they have different thoughts about what they would like and what is important to them. And they might just be assuming that those same things are important to all of them. But no worries. The guys have been friends for a long time and know that they need to work some stuff out. Without even really thinking about it, they begin communicating and clarifying. I was thinking pizza, says Mike. I had pizza for lunch. How about Thai or the diner for a change? I'm a little strapped for cash this week, so can we make it on the cheaper side, says Matt? And how are we going to get there, says Arlo. That's a good start, but now they dig a little deeper. I've got my mother's car this evening, so I can drive, says Matt. And the party doesn't start until later, so we've got plenty of time, says Mike. Last time I went to the Thai place, it was good, but it's not very cheap. We could try that taco place that just opened up on Maple Ave. Has anyone been there? Is it any good? I haven't heard anything about it, other than it's finally open. Tacos are cheap, but if they're bad, they're really bad. Is pizza out? I could go for a slice. I couldn't do pizza. But I guess I could order a cheesesteak instead. I'm just feeling a little cheesed out, you know? All right, pizza's off the list. And so is Ty. It'd be good, but it's too much to spend for this week. Fine trip. Yeah, but you could try something new. Right around here is when people fall into one of the biggest group decision traps, decision fatigue. This is when you get sick of discussing an issue and just want to throw in the towel and do whatever seems easiest. All right, I don't care anymore. Let's just get pizza like we always do. Then Chris says, I don't really want pizza. Come on. We just have to decide between the diner and the taco place. What do you think? Arlo replies, all right. Even though it might be a nice change, I don't know how good the taco place will be. I say we hold off on trying it until we hear something about it. And tonight, let's go to the diner. We've got a car so we can drive, which we might not have next week. There are all kinds of things on the menu, so people can be adventurous if they don't want burgers and fries. Plus, it's cheap and it's good. Excellent. Good job, guys. You communicated and clarified the elements of your decision basis, 
and thought your way to a good decision. And you stuck with it and didn't fall for decision fatigue. Way to go. Have a piece of cherry pie for me. So excellent way to keep in mind what uh, group fatigue is and uh, what alternatives we need to think about when we are in the group decision making setting. Okay, so we'll uh, pick up some uh, decision making models. I'll stop in between. We'll have some question and answers, uh, clarity, etc. So decision making is a skill that we can all learn and it definitely improves with practice. So there are six basic decision making models shown here. First one is scientific, it's knowledge based, more like a detective approach. Second one is ethical decision making, doing the right thing, the moral approach, and I'm going to expand on it towards the later part of the presentation. Economical net gain by doing cost benefit approach, political decision you make, will it be palatable to the people, which is a subjective approach, experience, past knowledge is a familiarity approach, and habitual, the default base, the passive approach. So out of these six models, one through five are proactive, sixth is reactive. So do not always fall for the reactive because the outcome will be suboptimal. And also keep in mind, for a level of decision you are making, and if it is very complex decision, you will be involving number of these models working simultaneously, working in tandem. So you can combine two or three of them to make a right decision. Very basic down to the earth, uh, six different ways of making decisions. And by the way, uh, this uh, decision making topic, I came into uh, to understand them when in 2013, I got a request from Illinois Park District, similar to a forestry department. They wanted to try, don't know the subject. I have to start learning the subject myself and start delivering and through delivery by getting the interactions and feedback from the people who you deliver it to you can become a better faculty. So that's a little nugget I wanted to share about making a decision. And throughout my life as a faculty in last 29 years, I've accepted challenges working on topics where I had no basic knowledge, but willing to learn. And uh, when I understood the topic well, then I delivered them. And people who come through the program, they appreciate it and enjoy it as well because I put myself in their shoes that if I was the one in the audience, will I accept the information and does it add value to them and are they able to use it for their work? So there is a, another article called Nine Steps to Decision Making. And this we all know, when we have many options and choices, the decision making could be very complicated, but it need not be we make it as complicated as we want to or as simple as we want to. So we need to take control and decide to be decisive. To develop the ability to be decisive is simply a mindset, a mental attitude which will come with practice and persistence. And there are nine steps to be decisive according to the article from Harvard Business Review. So first one is believe that you are decisive. Secondly, you need to visualize that you are a quick and firm decision maker. Third is important, no bad decision. Action beats inaction. Fourth, we need to be brave. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. But when you make a mistake, learn from the, that mistake and do not keep repeating the same mistake. Have faith in your decision, listen to your instinct, the gut feeling, take a step back to expand the possibilities to think out of the box, set a time limit, and a lot of people work under the tight deadlines. Persistent practice. So this is one of the rule of project management, make fast decisions often. In other words, you fail fast, to succeed sooner at the end. By doing small amount of activities, small tasks, subtasks, 
you figure it out whether it worked or not. And if it doesn't work, change it and continue moving. So fail fast to succeed sooner. That's persistent practice and think out loud. So this is where we look at how Google looks at it. When the situation requires a complex decision making, you clearly define the question, write down the options and the assumptions and share it with your colleagues. Those who are in the organization, those who are in your team and think about the positive upside and the downside, the negative, and make a concerted decision which will impact and give you the best possible outcome. So remember the nine steps to decision making. Now, uh, next article talks about culture of indecision. So keep in mind, making decision is one aspect, but implementing your decision in the setting at the organization level, whether at the institute or in the workplace, is the most important steps, which we generally do not focus much on. People are busy making decisions, but there are very few who are ready to take actions because they are either not part of the loop or they are not convinced or conveyed that the real importance of why the action needs to be taken. So the single most cause of corporate underperformance is the failure to execute. And uh, this we will tie it up with the strategic planning process as well. These failures will result from the misfires in personal interactions. And this is the way more often than not is the usual way the large and small decisions are made or not made for that reason throughout any organization and the inability to take decisive action is rooted in company's culture. Culture is the way in which work gets done, the standard norms and behaviors of people that creates the culture of the organization. So Dr. Ram Sharan, our distinguished alumnus batch of 1959 mechanical engineering is one of the world's top uh, leading consultant he only works with the CEOs of the world and he never uses any slides. He just picks up a chalk on the board and CEOs absorb each and every word coming from Dr. Ram Sharan. And uh, he is paid mega bucks for giving the proper advice. Uh, so his book talks about uh, leaders need to create a, create a culture which will break the culture of indecisiveness and focus on three major items. The leaders need to have intellectual honesty and courage in connections between the people. Secondly, organizations' social operating mechanism should have an honest dialogue at its core. And third, very important aspect, that as a leader, give the feedback and follow through to high achievers coach those who are struggling in the middle and discourage those whose behaviors are blocking the organization's progress. So in any organization, when you want to implement things, there will be three set of people who are the high achievers. You need to give them constantly feedback and follow through so they continue their great work. Some are struggling in the middle, give them coaching. And there will be a third of the group which will sabotage the implementation of your decision. So discourage them from taking any actions because it's counterproductive. Wonderful insight from Dr. Ram Sharan on breaking the culture of indecision. Now the next question comes, who makes the decision? And that ambiguity of who is accountable for what part of the decision leads to chaos in the organization and hurting the company's performance. So here is a very simple model proposed in this article. Model is rapid. R means who will recommend the cause of action on a key decision. A means who will agree to a recommendation before it will move forward. P means who will perform the actions needed to implement the decision. 
I means whose input is needed to determine the proposal's feasibility, and D means who will decide to bring the decision to a close and commit the organization to implement. So making decision is first part, but implementing it in uh, in the organization is the second aspect which needs to be focused and addressed upon. So a lot of good wisdom here. And when we clarify decision rules through rapid, you make right choices swiftly and effectively. Now, this is a homework for all the students at ITBHU. You will be getting this presentation slide deck after the session is over uh, through the <coughs> soft skill program page on the TPC website, training and placement cell at ITBHU. This is where you need to take a little bit of time to look at three meaningful decisions you have been you have made and reflect on during your spare time answering those 10 questions for key three meaningful decisions you have been through. What was the decision right, made with right speed, executed well, so on and so forth. Now this exercise will give you some guidance on what you are doing is it working is it giving you the best outcome or are you still struggling and if you are then you need to change your plan of action and try to become more effective decision maker so that's a decision diagnostic a couple of more models and we'll uh, start uh, interacting again why good leaders make bad decisions so this is another big issue so a lot of time leaders are smart, so they have the pattern recognition and emotional tagging, so they make quick decisions. But a lot of time they, that may, may or may not be effective decision because they could be distorted by self-interest, emotional attachments or misleading memories. So those are the red flags which will call for more analysis when leaders are making decision alone. It requires more analysis, including more debate by involving people, the stakeholders based on the question we received earlier, those who will be impacted and a stronger governance. So structure in place with the checks and balances to make sure that single individual is not making unilateral decisions which can come back and haunt the organization. Do not fall for the better decisions. What decisions leaders make have a tremendous impact throughout the organization because everybody else has to live with the outcome of that decision. Now, another interesting article was stop making plan, start making decisions. So this is in the context of strategic planning. So let's do brief discussion. I'm sure those who have done some training or uh, internship or those who are working in the industry or at the institute as a faculty or in the leadership position, strategic planning is extremely critical item for the leaders. When they do the strategic plan and most of the organization do the plan, However, only one third of those strategic plans get implemented and two third of them are on paper only. Why? One, when the strategic plan is getting drawn up, the leaders get excited and they have too many strategies on the plan. And you do not have unlimited resources or the time. So it's a sign of failure when you have too many strategies on your plan. So solution, try to prioritize with few three to four key strategy for a given year. That's one point. Secondly, those key strategies are not supported or funded with the right resources, people with the right talent and strength to solve those and work on those key strategies. So they are randomly assigned. And third, there is no rigorous reviews of those key strategies. And fourth, those strategies are not communicated in the organization, both internally or externally with key customers. So nobody has any clue 
to of what's happening and i'll put this in the context of national education policy 2020 this is one of the giant project all the institution higher learning as well as k through 12 schools have to implement by 2035 now what i've been seeing and observing at some of the institutes most of the time the assignment is given to the dean r and d he or she will work on it with a few people rest of the team rest of the organization is not involved and they are not kept in the loop and this is where we need to excite and engage and empower the entire organization including all staff all faculties to be part of that initiative where they can add value as appropriate to implement NEP 2020 effectively. So traditional strategic planning has some flows because it's generally done annually. Secondly, if you are in a large organization with say four divisions, each division will do their own strategic plan and there's no synergy to ramp it up at the higher level. So executives, they get frustrated by the constraints and they make unilateral decision or ad hoc decisions leading to making incorrect or slow decision making or no decision at all. So the article suggests that look at continuous issue focused strategic plan. So rather than work on everything, work on continuous issues focus strategic plan. Take one issue, focus on it and make a plan around it. Debate one issue at a time until you reached a decision to implement it and your reward is very high in terms of the average outcome. So let me populate that. So average number of major strategic decisions reached per year on a traditional annual review focused on business units, you will make hardly two and a half decisions per year on an average. Focused on issues, you will improve to 3.5. Continuous review focused on business units, 4.1. But continuous review focused on issues will lead to 6.1 decisions per year. So remember the comment I made that Alan Malala, when he moved from Boeing, after retiring, he came to Ford Motor Company and every week he will get all his managers around the world on a two hour conference call to strategically plan reviewed in real time every Friday to make sure that the actions they are taking and the projects they are on are relevant and that will keep them ahead of the rest of the competition. So that's how you need to make the strategic plan more like leaving plan rather than keep it as a exercise once a year and put it in the folder and it keeps getting dust. Uh, so at this point, I want to stop and have some interaction. And uh, let's go back and take some questions. And we'll take two questions at this point from the campus and two questions from Gedariji. So let's keep going. <laughs> Dr. Mora, uh, Mora ji, mm -hmm. question is, what if a decision we take, it disappoints or impacts negatively certain section of the society, certain section of people? Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, when you have to make a tough decisions, which can have impact on various strata of the society, first you want to optimize the outcome so that maximum number of people will get positive benefit. Keep in mind that uh, some may or may not get the benefit in the round one. Learn from that outcome of that decision and make necessary changes to improve the reach for the other parts of the society. Uh, next question, please. Uh, you have already mentioned number of factors which are going to affect the outcome of a decision. But point is, how do we weigh one factor over the other in case mm -hmm. maybe they do not go in the same line? Yeah. Yeah. So you have to look at the ultimate impact of your decision in terms of the finance, in terms of your reputation and whichever factor is dominant, you have to stay with that as a primary 
and other factors are supporting your decision making to achieve the most beneficial results you can think of. Gidari ji, quick one or two questions, please. Thank you, Anil Kumar ji. Sir, just you don't know whether you are making a right decision or a wrong decision. You will not have at that instant. But yes, once you have taken the decision, you will see the consequences whether it was positive impact or a negative impact. Positive impact, well and good. Negative impact means you have to learn from what did not work, what came in the way, and how do we make a change next time around. And most of the time, it's not just the decision itself, but the way it gets implemented through the people, that's where the problem starts. Because when decision is made, if it was unilateral, people who are going to implement it have no idea why its decision is made. They are just asked to do it. So they will do it without their heart into it. And that's the key point. Involve them in the decision making if they are going to be involved and they are going to be impacted directly as well as the part of the implementation team. And if you do that, chances of implementation will be much higher. Uh, any quick other question? Otherwise, we'll keep moving. We have a segment to cover. One more, Kidariji, if you have any. Okay, not hearing one. No, 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 sir. Yeah, no, no issue. You can keep collecting. And I have one more YouTube coming. So when I share every time, I have to click that include system audio box, which I have done this time. And we are ready to roll. OK, I want to share with you part of the decision making, managing your time. So we can use Dr. Stephen Covey's time management metrics. We mentioned about Dr. Stephen Covey in the session one on effect in uh, leadership excellence. Y axis important or not important. X axis urgent or not urgent. So according to Dr. Covey, in order to be effective in the work setting, you need to spend 90 to 95 percent of your time in quadrant two, top right. Important, but not urgent. So this is where you will think about working on prevention issues, building the relationship with your stakeholders, doing all the excellent planning, training, quality, etc. And when you have done some good work, you take time out and recharge your battery. Next, 5 to 10 percent effort in the quadrant one, important and urgent, more like a firefighting, get it out of the way. Do not spend all the time in firefighting. And a quick uh, humorous comment, sometimes the clever people will start the fire, then they will rush in with the fire extinguisher and become the heroes. Uh, people at the top generally are disconnected on what's happening at the ground. So they will reward those people who have rushed in. In the first place, they have started the fire and they have put it out. So they will be touted as the heroes. The heroes are the one who are working in quadrant two. Important, not urgent. Quadrant three and four has no place to spend time on at your workplaces. So simple guidance will allow you to refocus your energy, your limited time, to focus on the right thing, to get the best decisions and implement them well. So here is another guidance point for decision making. You get a lot of information coming your way while you are working on a project, working in a team. Create four buckets. First bucket is things you need to do and you can only do it yourself. Put it in that bucket, do. Second one, you have somebody who can help you getting it done. So delegate it carefully and clearly what is the objective and don't tell them what to do. Just tell them what is expected of them, the final end point, macro management, not micromanagement. Third, delay. 
you are the one who need to do it, but you are tied up on an important aspect of the project. So you put it on a yellow sticky paper. This is what I will come back to in one week, then go ahead and get it done. And uh, majority of stuff coming your way, put it in the dump basket. And that will free you from doing the right thing. That is the things you need to do, things you need to delegate, and some of the things you have delayed, you go back and get it done. So always keep four buckets, do delegate, delay, and dump handy. So with that, uh, in the interest of time, I'll cover this module and then we'll have enough time for further interactions. So I've added this module on ethical decision making because this is the important part of making a decision in life at every level for all of us. So where does the ethics begin? It starts at our own family unit. So the way our parents have dealt with the situation will give us the idea about being ethical. Then we go to K through 12 school system. Unfortunately, some of the students get on the wrong path, start copying and uh, stealing somebody else's information and labeling it as their own. That is not ethics. Come to the colleges and universities for undergrad, grad, postgrad work. Again, if you have that bad habit of taking somebody else's work and stealing somebody's work, that will not help you. And the ethics. Short term, you may benefit, but in the long term, you pay big price. So ethics is the foundation and this begins at home. So what is ethical behavior? So normally when we are confronted with making a decision, there is a clear path, either is black or white. When it's clear cut, no issue. But a lot of time those decisions fall into the gray area, neither black, nor white. So at that point, you have to answer those four questions. Is the decision truthful? Is it fair to everyone affected? Will it build goodwill for the organization? And will the decision beneficial to all parties who have vested interest in the outcome? So truthful, fair, build the goodwill and benefit to all stakeholders. If answer to all these four questions is yes, you proceed, your decision will be ethical. If answer to any one of the question comes back as no, stop, do not go there, that decision will not be ethical. So there is no right way to do a wrong thing. This is the line we have to draw in the sand. What are the reasons to be an ethical business? It's more profitable. It will protect your brand and your reputation. It's the right thing to do. It builds the customer trust and loyalty, and it builds the investor confidence. So there are a lot of positive upside if you do the ethical business, and ultimately your business will continue to flourish and succeed and remain in business sustainable over a long time because you are ethical. So here comes some bad news. So there is a World Corruption Index 2020 list uh, recently updated out of 180 countries. India is in the middle of the pack, ranked number 86. We have a row score of 40 out of 100. Of course, Denmark is number one, uh, USA is 25 and uh, back end Somalia and South Sudan, they are the tied for the 179 and 180. So India has a lot of work to do in improving the corrupt culture of corruption. Then there is the world's most ethical companies 2021 list. Out of 135 global companies listed, only three got a mention from India, Infosys, Tata Steel and Wipro and majority of those organizations, companies were in giving and accepting. People got blinded and unfortunately the settlement has not been reached. People who got affected, they have passed on. I'm only going to talk about uh, items bolded, uh, respect to India, 2007 2D spectrum scam, 
2010 Commonwealth Games scandal, which got the black eye for India, and 2018. Recently, there were some paper leaks in UP, paper leaks in Rajasthan, and those are unethical practices, and it comes from bribery, dishonesty, greed, leading to unethical behavior. Now, uh, I want to show a very short YouTube about a scandal which engulfed the Enron energy trading company, which was artificially manufacturing sc uh, the <coughs> scarcity of uh, energy in the uh, state of California. So they were artificially raising the price of the energy futures, gas and electricity for the state, and they were holding them hostage. As a result, ultimately Enron folded and it took Arthur Anderson, number one accounting company in the world, founded here in Chicago, that also perished because they were doing auditing and they were also consulting as, as a business partner with Enron. And both sides knew there was something hanky-panky and they allowed it to happen. So let's quickly look at the YouTube and then we'll be wrapping it up. It's taken Enron 16 years to go from about 10 billion of assets to 65 billion of assets. It took them 24 days to go bankrupt. Just an immediate sense of outrage at lay and skilling and fast style when people realized how much they had profited and how completely artificial the appearance of this company had been. That nobody could really understand. And in fact, that many of Kenley's lieutenants questioned. They said this business can't be making this much money legitimately. Something weird is going on. Mark-to-market accounting allowed Enron to book potential future profits on the very day a deal was signed. No matter how little cash actually came in the door, to the outside world, Enron's profits could be whatever Enron said they were. Things that fascinated me was that almost all of the Wall Street analysts who covered Enron had buy ratings or strong buy ratings on the company's stock. One analyst who didn't buy the company line became an enemy of Enron. Enron's CFO, Andy Fastow, had his eye on John Olson, one of the only analysts skeptical of the Enron story. Enron loved analysts' strong buy recommendations. Merrill was informed by Fastow, either you get somebody who is on board with us and has a strong buy recommendation and loves us at the same time, or we don't do any business with you. Merrill Lynch fired John Olson. Soon after, Fastow rewarded the bank with two investment banking jobs worth $50 million. His job was to cover up the fact that Enron was becoming a financial fantasy land. To please the boss, Fastow had to figure out a way to keep the stock price up by hiding the fact that Enron was $30 billion in debt. Enron was just stashing its debt in Fastow's companies where investors couldn't see it. LJM was Fastow's most ambitious creation. It would work magic for Enron, and it would allow Fastow to conjure $45 million for himself. Returns that would exceed 2,000%. 96 individual bankers invested in LJM and America's major banks put up as much as 25 million each. The Enron fraud is the story of synergistic corruption. There are supposed to be checks and balances in the system. The lawyers are supposed to say no. The accountants are supposed to say no. The bankers are supposed to say no, but no one who was supposed to say no said no. They all took their share of the money from the fraud and put it in their pockets. Enron paid its advisors well. In 2001, the accounting firm Arthur Anderson received one million a week. Enron's law firm, Vincent and Elkins, did nearly as well. Oh, for instance, one email I remember where the banker writes, Enron loves these deals. They produce cash, but they don't have to show the debt on the balance sheet. Now, a high school student can figure out that the banks were all knowing participants in this wrongdoing. Merrill Lynch assisted Enron in cooking its books by pretending to purchase an existing Enron asset when it was really engaged in a loan.
California was selected by Enron as the prime place to experiment with this new concept of deregulated electricity. Commodity that normally trades in the $35 to $45 range, high prices are when it gets in the 50s or $1,000. Prices aren't just paid thousand bucks forever. We have the weak people in the market now. Get rid of them, and you know what? The people who are strong stick around it. Traders soon discovered that by shutting down power plants, they could create artificial shortages that would push prices. Guys, to get a little creative, okay, and come up with a reason to go down, like a forced outage type of thing, right? Those. West Coast traders made nearly $2 billion for Enron. The difference is between the state of California and the Titanic. At least when the Titanic went down, the lights were on. In 2001, less than four months after Skilling's resignation, Enron declared bankruptcy. Its accounting firm, Arthur Anderson, had begun destroying its Enron files. Enron's accounting firm, Arthur Anderson, was convicted of obstructing justice. With its reputation for honesty destroyed, America's oldest accounting firm fell along with Enron, and 29,000 people lost their jobs. A mischief, fragmentation, and plausible deniability. If you know the information, you deny personal knowledge of the scandal success and impunity. So when you are getting good results, you don't question the wrong way of doing the business. It's a slippery slope and it's a in-group language, hide and rationalize unethical behavior. And this is a challenge each and every organization to take it seriously and the impetus and the responsibility, responsibility belongs to the top leader. They themselves need to be ethical and they need to enforce the ethics throughout the organization by giving initial training, ongoing yearly training to ensure people are ethical and have ethical work in the organization. This brings to value education in India. All the educators need to focus on inculcating the character building values like ethics, honesty and integrity, three foundation of the leadership uh, compassion for others, practice of nonviolence, practice of truth, respect for elderly, respect for the environment and reverence for teachers and spirit of collaboration and cooperation. This is one of the value addition, value education requirement from the NEP 2020 as well. So ethics for success honesty, integrity, quality, responsibility, trust and respect, having excellent leadership, it will all lead to having wonderful ethics at the organization, leading to sustainable organization growth and success. So how do organizations shape ethical conduct? It starts with the ethical leadership at the top. They will force the ethical actions throughout the organization by providing ethical education on an ongoing basis, and they will continue to raise about ethical awareness. And top organizations have a chief ethics officer reporting directly to the top person in the organization. And when there are infringement or incidents have been updated several times, and Patrick Lencioni's books are excellent in terms of leadership and decision making. So in summary, Decision making will require use of AMA. Ability determines what we are capable of doing. Motivation determines how you do it, but it's the attitude that will determine how well you do it. So have a positive attitude. Secondly, to have good decision making, we need to engage all three H's, heart for the emotions, head for ideas and logic, and hands for implementation. And leadership ability is to translate the vision into action and action into next level of vision for decision making. Ethical decision making is essential for success of individuals and organizations and decide to be lifelong learners. That's a decision we all can make. With that, here is the plan. Uh, today we are at the session two, four more session coming next session, Friday, same time. 
uh, for 8th of April on effective time management. And uh, please write down two key takeaways from today's session. I'll stop sharing and we are ready to take questions from the campus first and then followed by questions from Gidhar Lalji. Okay, go ahead, Anil Kumarji. Yes, sir. Great, sir, great. Okay, Anil Kumarji, question first, then we'll go to Gidhar Lalji. So there were two more, two questions, like maybe these hmm. were submitted quite in the beginning itself. Uh, they wanted to know how do you establish priorities and how do you evaluate uh, option, etc. You have already given the answer. You look into the timeline, whether it is urgent, not so urgent, and then maybe you look into the important part, important, not so important. So I believe yes. that you have already given the answer, so people should be satisfied. Going away from today's uh, topic itself, there are people who want to know, maybe there is something related to your first talk. How is it that you are going to make a good leader? Like uh, you, I, I'll suggest that the people should go on YouTube recording, which is going to be shared by All India Council for Technical Education. Because in that slide, you have already discussed how do you make a good leader in a corporate hierarchy. So, any comment in case you have it, like maybe within a minute, in case you can tell. Sure. Yeah, I think the key is we all can. We are all leaders. The question is, do we want to become a good or excellent leader? So in order to do that, I had one slide shared in the last session that first that a willingness to become a good or excellent leader is first step. Second step is get some feedback about your behavior. The way you are behaving as a leader or as a member of the team, is it coming in the way for others? So get that feedback from your colleagues and uh, make changes in your way of doing things, which will sort of smoothen out the workflow and that will have positive impact on the rest of the people. You have to have short term and long term action plan on working on those issues, get some additional training. And when you do that, continue to review the progress and ultimately if you get good progress and good results, celebrate. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, so can we move to Gidhar Lalji for questions? Do we need to be ethical and always? <laughs> yeah, so this is a tough question, Gidhar Lalji. I, I understand. But uh, let me put it this way. If you are ethical in all your dealings, you have nothing to hide and you don't have a two personality, one unethical and other ethical, because then you will be caught up in a web of talking uh, something which is not right, uh, something which is a lie, and you will keep that web of So, do not limit. And uh, the Jeffrey Skillings, the president of Enron, was a student at uh, Oxford, along with one of the most revered faculty from Harvard Business Review. And uh, one became faculty, the other one went to corporate. The person at Enron, Jeffrey Skilling, crossed the line on ethics and he was removed from the organization and shamed for misleading the stakeholders. And uh, of course, the person who went to Harvard, he recently passed away about a year back. He was the most revered Harvard Business faculty, Professor Emeritus. So this is what happens when you cross the line once. You have a tendency to get temporary benefit, but in the long term you will suffer and organizations get wiped out, nations get wiped out because of the unethical behavior. And uh, this is where we have to do better. I'll leave it at that. Any additional questions? And now, if not, uh, let's take some comments, one or two from the campus. Anil Kumarji, you are the right person to give some comments. Uh, may I, if you, with your permission, I would like to answer the question raised by Girdhari Lalji. He said, like, mm -hmm. maybe what to do when we are supposed to force or forced to take a quick decision. Mm -hmm. Was that was that the, 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 
was that the question like dr gidhai lal ji you said like sir, maybe all of a sudden you have to take some decision this is just i am taking from youtube sir <laughs> Uh, like maybe these are operational thing. Like these are technical glitches. We will find you will encounter. Like maybe, but uh, this is basically an operational problem. Like maybe you are sorting out. You are looking for an action. Actions are different from decision. Once you decide, then you take the follow up action. You decide like the follow up action and so on and so forth. So like maybe that's the kind of framework you have. But decision when you talk about like maybe decision, something you do, something you are going to plan, which is going to impact your performance. Correct or not? So, like maybe over here, the decision had already been taken that this uh, whole the talk has to be has to go on YouTube live. So that decision was taken. Now it was a matter of action. <laughs> That's where. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, otherwise, yeah. Uh, like maybe when you have problem, like maybe when you're talking about, uh, like maybe short term decision, my suggestion would be that always focus on the stakeholder number one, and in case these are operational decision, then create a kind of system. Keeping in mind your stakeholder, when you create the system, what happens is like this: you basically avoid the variance in decision making. Decision making is uniform for everybody, number one, and then you are in a position to take the faster decision because there is a system in place, and that system can uh, can take care of fast decision making. That's my uh, uh, way of working also. Yeah. Uh, so my that's way, way, since you are going to in, uh, take care of uh, your stakeholder, you are very sure that decision will be accepted. Will be accepted. Can you believe, Dr. Girdhari Lalji? In this campus itself, the students have paid fine worth rupees one lakh, and many of the people do not know. There was no you reaction. At all. Uh, there was no reaction at all. Even my director does not know. Even the person sitting next to my office doesn't know that this is what has happened. Okay. Uh, comments from you, Gidhar Lalji, for the session. No, sir, it's a most wonderful session. Something uh, every time we are learning something. Actually, we are doing everything every day. Every time we are taking decision, but we we are missing something. Today we learned that we are missing like a uh, priorities. Who to delegate? Karna hai, kaun sa kya karna hai. We are doing all these things. But sometimes, in a hectic manner or pressure or something like that, we are missing. But if we are taking some few minutes for planning, na, we can do like four steps: yes. delegate and delay and all these things. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you brought up the importance of planning. So one of the session will focus on that. Dr. Deming cycle: plan, do, study, and act. Yeah, yeah. So 10% excellent plan and 90% flawless execution will can will bring the great value for any and every project you undertake, every activity you undertake. So planning is extremely important, and a lot of time we get excited and start implementing without a plan. That means you are on a wild chase. You don't know what the path is. No plan done. You just want to execute, and that is not good. So we'll have some more discussion on that in the project management topic. And uh, are there any key takeaways we can reflect upon coming through the chat box? So Anil Kumar ji, if there are any, and same thing, Gidhar Lal ji, we can talk for about uh, last four minutes because that's the essence of what people are picking up from the session. मेरा टेकअवे ये है कि जस्ट मैं जो यूज करता हूँ अनिल सर को अच्छा लगेगा आई से यस एवरी टाइम देन आई एम सेइंग यस माय कॉन्शियस है ब्रोडन देन आई एम टेकिंग डिसीजन बेटर इट इज गुड फॉर अवर अस और नॉट मैं जब भी कोई काम बोलते हैं सबसे पहले हाँ करता हूँ हाँ करने के बाद ये देखता हूँ कि कैसे ये अच्छा हो सकता है और कितने लोगों के लिए अच्छा हो सकता है वेरी गुड हेलीकॉप्टर पैरासूट नीकॉप्टर नेगेटिव एटीट्यूड मेक ए पैरासूट ना 
I don't think that I have any feedback from this friend on this con. Yeah. Yeah, I think going forward, we will need to get some one or two key takeaways at a minimum one from the attendees. So we can see what they are grasping from the session. And that is the essence of learning. Listening is OK, but uh, making something out of it and uh, synthesizing to pick up one or two critical areas they would like to work on. That's an important way to learn that we need to instill in our student and faculty as well. Uh, Manuji, at this issue, the students will be involved in polling uh, mm -hmm. this evening itself. Once we get the feedback from them, we'll compile it and pass it on to you. OK, thank you. Manu sir, one minute. Lena chahunga. Last 30 years, I am doing something. If we uh, thoda introspect karenge ya meditation karenge, yoga karenge ya exercise karenge, matlab jitna time thoda apne saath rahenge, utna decision thoda acha rahega. Ye mere ko thoda samjh paaya. Yes, no, I think you are absolutely right. Uh, spending time with yourself—that's a decision we all need to make. To listen to your inner voices, yes, and that that's... will guide you for the further journey. And uh, I made a comment, if you remember at the last session, that as a leader, we need to manage ourselves 50% of our time. So if we can't manage ourselves, uh, how can we manage others? How can we lead others? So self-management is extremely important, and you need to understand how to do it well and keep practicing. It comes with the practice. So. Excellent point, Gidhar Laji. Your, your point is gut feeling, like a gut feeling. No? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and spend time on uh, reflection, introspection at the self level, away from the noise and clutter of the world. So, and I generally do that while I'm walking in the house five miles a day, every day for the last 10 years. So I'm reflecting on things which has worked, which have not worked, and what can I do to make it better going forward. So with that simple thing, we come to a close. Uh, it's right on money. 11, 11, 11. Yeah. And, so before uh, we close, like maybe I must thank you, uh, Dr. Boraji, for your nice presentation, and Girdhari Lalji for being present here during the, your talk itself. He had been wonderful person. Maybe the kind of queries he raised, the kind of input he provided. It must be valuable for all of us, particularly for the young uh, people. Shakti Tiwari ji, he is also present. You, he also deserves a big thanks from my side. Girdhari Lalji, please convey our sincerest thanks to your all team members at AICT New Delhi. And our and no program. Team is working day and night for uh, this uh, soft uh, skill programs. Uh, <laughs> and no, and no program will be successful unless until no, no, the no. people who, for whom this program is meant, they are available. So yes, yes, maybe my students and the teachers from various colleges that are associated with AICT, they also deserve my big thank. A big clap for yes. all of you. Yes, my and uh, Rahul Kumar ji for live streaming the program. Yeah, so, Rahul and, and then maybe, and then maybe sure. nonetheless, in the last, I'd like to uh, maybe shower my blessing and big yeah. thanks to my team members over here who are doing a wonderful job. Good. Okay, thank you all. We'll uh, meet again, up again next week. Very grateful to Manu Boraji, actually. Ah. <laughs>